everyone. My name is Dr. Marsha Braden. I'm a clinical psychologist here in Colorado Springs, Colorado, a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the National Fragile X Foundation. And I want to talk to you today about dealing with what's going on with the current stress and the coronavirus. I want to welcome you all to this webinar. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're joining me in the webinar. And thanks again to the National Fragile X Foundation for sponsoring this time together today. I've received an outpouring of requests and the need for reassurance during the past few weeks. So I hope that this webinar provides you with help to deal with this difficult time, but also provides you with the hope that we're here to support you and that you are not alone. Anxiety is really um, what's going on with all of us at this point. Who isn't a bit anxious? And I think that that's a key to dealing with the current situation. Um, anxiety affects all people different ways and people in our care who have Fragile X syndrome. It also affects all of us in the family that may or may not have Fragile X syndrome. And so we really want to take advantage of this opportunity to look into those things that may in fact be contributing to anxiety and therefore uh, behavioral challenges. So people with Fragile X syndrome have, may have um, intellectual language and sensory deficits, but one thing that they're really good at is observing and feeling the emotion of all of them, all of us around them it's really important to think of that when we're considering anxiety right now and what's going on with all of us being a little fearful and anxious. When we're emotional and worried and anxious, we become afraid um, and they feel that. They feel it um, as we do, but they don't talk about it necessarily. They can't talk about their feelings uh, and what's going on with them directly. So they take our emotions, uh, they take it all in, but instead of talking about their worry with us, they may act it out, they may withdraw, or they even tr may try to calm us and to make us feel better. So today I wanna talk about what's really going on and what we can do to make things better for our, our people in our lives that have Fragile X syndrome. So the big thing is change, and it really hit us, didn't it? It hit us hard with the changes in our lifestyle and what's going on, dealing with social isolation, uh, sheltering in place, and all of the things that go with the current um, mandate that we have related to the virus. So here are the things that your kids are seeing, and your adults as well. They're looking at places in a, in a grocery store, we have to stand on a certain place and we have to be careful of how close we get to people. We're wearing masks to protect us and everybody around us is wearing a mask to protect us. And we're sort of sheltering in place, we're staying home. We're not going to a great deal of places, nor are we doing anything that is the norm. So let's think about all these changes. I mean, changes is one of the most common antecedents that we see in um, challenges and behavioral challenges in our population and people with fragile X. So if you look at the changes that your child or adolescent or adult has experienced in the last few weeks, it really is um, difficult to, to even fathom. We look at those changes as being that they're at home more and they're at home without a normal schedule. We know that individuals with Fragile X syndrome love and crave routine and schedules, and that is really a calming agent for them. And so when that's taken away, things get really ramped up in terms of their own personal anxiety. They're not having contact with the significant others that they know and love. And we know that people with Fragile X syndrome love other people and love the social connectedness of other people. And so this is sort of a double whammy for them. They're not seeing their para, they're not seeing their coworker if they have jobs, they're not seeing friends if they're going out in the community and or their teachers. And so that makes it really difficult. They're not seeing extended family members and not being able to visit extended family members that they have commonly been uh, doing in the past. Parents are probably home more. 
They may even be working from home, which creates another um, number of, of issues for them because they may have to be in a room where they're quiet while their parent is working on a computer. Their siblings are home. Um, many of them, if they're typically developing, may in fact be engaged in online learning. And so again, that's another thing that will look different to those individuals with Fragile X syndrome. And some of our individuals with Fragile X are even trying the online learning and doing some things with their class. And that's a real change for them, of course. They're not able to go into grocery stores, malls, their school, churches or synagogues are closed and all of their community based activities or even a work, a job has been canceled. So those changes are, are significant. They're significant for all of us, but particularly significant for those who have Fragile X syndrome. So just kind of a recap from what I've learned about behavior and what I've learned from people with Fragile X about behavior is that they really tell us what they need. And if we're smart enough to figure that out by watching those behaviors, even if they're aberrant, we can help them. It's our job to give them better, more adaptive and appropriate ways to communi communicate their needs, communicate what's going on inside of them. And rather than just giving us um, a behavioral outburst, they may in fact be trying to communicate to us what's going on with them. We have to observe their behavior and look into the function. And the function is um, really important to intervention, to modifying the behavior. So all of those behavioral excesses are generally, generally not intentional. It's just their way of dealing with their neurobiology and also their way of communicating what's going on with them. So again, when we see them doing things that seem to be maladaptive, like maybe, you know, putting themselves between two cushions, what they're really telling us is, I'm trying to calm myself. My neurobiology is telling me that I need some calming, that I'm dysregulated. And so our job is to give them maybe some input with uh, just an example, uh, maybe we're giving, having them wear a weighted jacket or maybe a weighted vest or maybe they have a special chair or a cushion, a way for them to get that input but more adaptive, in a more adaptive way. So we know what happens um, with individuals with Fragile X when they're engaged in a behavioral cycle. We know that some of those behavioral issues come from the uh, neurobiological underpinnings, which is our first sort of circle here, I guess it looks like a, an oval, to kind of look at what in fact is going on. So they might have a gross and fine motor issue that we're punching on at that point and asking them to deal with or asking them to perform around. Maybe they're having that anxiety that we talked about, um, waiting filling free time, being home from school, that is a real um, need there and a cause for anxiety. Maybe there's some sensory dysfunction going on and we're asking them to get into a room with lots of noise. At this point, that's not happening, but in fact, that can happen in the long run. Language delays and even intellectual or cognitive delays. So when we ask them to perform any one of those, a task in any one of those areas, we know that they may in fact behave differently. They may uh, tell us that that is too hard for them, but they can't say, you know, I have trouble with gross and fine motor problems, so I can't write my name here on. And it doesn't look the same as the other kids. Instead, they would respond in terms of a behavioral excess or maybe an outburst, or maybe they might even uh, turn inward. Sometimes the girls get really sensitive to those things and feel as though they're failing and they may withdraw. So again, those are the things that then come out in a behavior. So I've just given a few examples of they might run away, they might flop on the floor, they may destroy the stimuli that you're providing to them uh, to ride on, but those kinds of things would happen as a result of us asking them to perform certain activities that would require them to have an intact neurobiological system. And then the next piece is extremely important, and that is the response from us as a parent or a teacher or a therapist. 
our response to that behavior, which is basically communicating to us, I don't know what you want, or I can't do it right, or I'm going to fail at this and I'm embarrassed, our response to that behavior is then critical to the outcome because it has the potential to either maintain or to reduce that behavior. And if we look at what's going on today and the things that we're asking our, our individuals in our homes that have Fragile X syndrome to do, we know that some of our response patterning is really causing them to have more anxiety or to be more distressed. So we have to now kind of look at those foundations. In other words, going back to the slide before and understanding that our response pattern will help with this whole process and outcome, we want to really understand um, the behavior. We have to understand some fundamental aspects of that behavior. So I always talk about behavior serving a purpose. It's very true. And that's not just for those with Fragile X syndrome, it's for all of us. We behave in certain ways to get an outcome, to have an outcome. And behaviors never continue unless they're reinforced in some way. So again, typical, all kinds of behavioral therapy for typically developing individuals. We, we tout this. We say that if you um, don't continue, uh, that you won't continue the behavior unless we reinforce it. It's really true. Uh, in other words, sometimes we reinforce ourselves by having something to eat or going shopping and we say oh i got through this week it was really difficult and i'm going to go get something new or i'm going to go do something for me now that's not always bad but if you're a compulsive shopper it does become a problem so in other words you're getting reinforced for a behavior that you may in fact be trying to eliminate or reduce so we have to change that whole thing around and make it so that you are not being reinforced for the same sort of things that you're trying to, to avoid or get rid of or reduce. And sometimes the reinforcing aspect of the behavior is internal. Um, we may be doing something that um, provides a lot of relief to us or calming to us. Sometimes eating and chewing does that. And yet that may in, for, in fact be causing us some issues. If you don't address the cause of the behavior, then it'll never change. So again, those foundations are really important. Look for that purpose, look for that function, and it looks something like this. So these are, are different purposes that behavior may in fact serve. Um, sometimes we have um, an individual acting out so that they can get to a preferred activity. I always tell the story about going through the checkout counter and um, the child is behaving perfectly well until they get to that place where all the candy and gum is and you're checking out and there's people behind you. And of course that's not happening today, but we do know that that does happen. And all of a sudden there's all kinds of, of problems there um, in terms of acting out. And the reason they're acting out is that they know at that particular time, you're gonna give in and you're gonna buy gum or candy because you need to get through the line and everybody has that expectation. They also may be doing something with the megaphone called attention seeking. They literally may be trying to get your attention. And so they're gonna do some things that are sort of obnoxious in some ways or some things that are sort of out of the ordinary and just to get your attention. So that's the purpose behind it. They also may be trying to avoid something that's uncomfortable to them. Or again, maybe we're asking them to do something that's part of their uh, neurobiological structure that is very difficult for them. So again, here's some of, of the um, sort of uh, purposes of, of behavior and some of the functions of behavior. As we said before, some of these behaviors are more difficult to extinguish because they're internally motivating. Now, it's really hard to believe that kids with Fragile X would bite themselves, adults and, and adolescents as well, but they often do that. And why do they do that? Well, basically, a lot of times they're biting their hand and, and pushing toward their head as a way to get co-contraction to their joints or as a way to calm themselves. And again, this is maladaptive, but on the other hand, it's really critical uh, for them to have that need met. And so it's our job, again, to develop ways that we can help uh, modify those particular behaviors and replace them with more adaptive behaviors. 
So we always talk about the ABCs of behavior, and it's kind of a, a nifty sort of chart here because it really does work. Um, if we take, per, take uh, note of these different things, we want to look at the antecedent first, which is really the thing that happens before the behavior. And oftentimes, uh, this is something that we're not paying a lot of attention to. So what do we spend time looking at and paying attention to? It's the behavior, isn't it? Because that's what gets our attention. But if we kind of look at what happened before that behavior, we're going to be a better detective. We're going to figure out exactly what's directing that behavior. And so again, the antecedent, then the behavior, and then we get a consequence. We give or deliver a consequence. If it's a reinforcer, then that simply means that we're reinforcing that, that behavior. We're, we're hoping that um, it will increase the probability of that behavior if it's a good behavior. If it's a bad behavior, an aberrant behavior, then we want to be careful what our consequence is because we, in fact, may be reinforcing that behavior. If we look at that antecedent then again, and we're really careful to take a look at what happened before, we may very well discover that there was a change or that there was something that happened that was a loud event or a noise, or that the person with Fragile X overheard a conflictual sort of conversation between members of, of maybe two people in the family. And that that conflict or that conversation is actually the antecedent that we're not even considering in terms of the behavior. We're not considering it as part of that behavioral chain because the person with Fragile X was not directly involved with that particular um, conversation. And then the behavior is clear. It's the, the specific act of the behavior and then the consequence, what happens directly afterwards. So being good detectives and figuring out what that antecedent is, is really very important uh, to the outcome. And again, today, as we're dealing with shelter in place and changes in schedules and environments, we see that's a huge antecedent to many um, underlying behaviors. A little bit hard sometimes to determine that antecedent. We might just see that our child is unhappy and we're trying to figure out what it is. Parents tell me oftentimes that a child is getting excited about an event and then all of a sudden doesn't want to go. And so that's really hard, isn't it? Because there's something going on prior to the event that has caused the individual with Fragile X syndrome uh, to behave a certain way. So it's kind of hard to determine those uh, antecedents. And where do you start? I mean, do you go back and look at everything that's happened in the last two days? That's a little bit too um, difficult to do, but we can really uh, create other additional issues um, when we try to make things better. In other words, if we don't look at that foundation and we don't go back and really look at those antecedents in sort of a systematic way, and we try to make things better for maybe a minute, we're trying to talk the child out of the behavior, we're trying to, to let's make a deal. So, you know, remember we wanted to go to grandpa's and we talked about it, we had our social story and you wanted to go. Those kinds of attempts sometimes in the moment are not the best thing to try because it really adds to the anxiety the child is experiencing at that point. So when we make changes in a systematic way, we really can decrease um, any of the subsequent um, behaviors and even need for interventions. So what I'm basically saying is if we spend a lot of time and effort in that figuring out that antecedent and figuring out sort of that trigger for the behavior, we can really save ourselves a lot of time um, in, the, in the long run in terms of intervention. At this point in time, it's pretty easy to figure out what's going on um, to, to really um, know what, what those behaviors are about. We know that those changes are really critical and some of the things that are happening to our entire family make it really difficult for these individuals with Fragile X. A lot of times, as we said before, if we really focus on the consequence, we're going to be able to also look at ways where we may be maintaining that behavior. Remember the example that I gave going through the grocery store line and reinforcing by buying something for the child just to make them quiet for a moment has really now turned the tables on you because 
every time you get to that place in the store, your child is probably going to exhibit the same behavior in hopes that, that, that he'll be able to be reinforced with um, something that he wanted there. So again, we have to be careful about that. If we um, have a consequence of maybe um, crying or being upset or yelling or screaming um, as a result of the behavior, uh, that may in fact be problematic to the child because it may start the cycle all over again and create the fear and anxiety that we were trying to target in the first place. Here's some of the triggers uh, for the challenging behaviors that we see. And I've tried to wrap into what I normally talk about with the current situation. So there are a couple of additional sorts of stressors that we maybe wouldn't have had in normal times, but I think it's important to provide these to you at this point. We know right now the lack of structure, being home, without the normal work activities of school, um, not being able to do the things that they typically do through their day, or even those adults and adolescents that go to work and have community-based um, activities. It really is very difficult um, to understand what's going on. And so those can be potential triggers, all of that lack of structure, the changes that they're experiencing. Now, if we try to set them up with little jobs around the house, and we'll talk about that in a moment, it's really important that you set them up, but make sure that you provide reinforcement. This is also important for teaching staff once we start schools again, or in a job setting, there needs to be reinforcement. There needs to be a break. There needs to be something in their schedule that gives them a chance to know um, that they're doing something right, and kind of an attaboy that we all need. There's a trigger with making them um, engage in things or trying to make them engage in things that have low interest. We know that individuals with Fragile X, no matter what the age, um, love, love to help us, don't they? They love to be helpers. They're cooperative. They like to have a job. If we don't provide them with those opportunities, they really aren't going to um, be at their best because they're helpers. They're people that like to, to make us feel better. They like to contribute, and what a wonderful attribute. So let's make sure that we engage them in those particular activities, because if we don't, again, we have potential uh, for triggering some, some challenging behaviors. Again, the not preparing for changes or transitions. It was a little bit hard when the bomb dropped and we had to start staying inside and we were not going to school or work anymore. That was a little hard to prepare them for. I don't think even any of us uh, as caregivers or parents are really, really adjusting that well to this. We didn't have a lot of preparation, did we, for these changes? And I think we're all trying to kind of figure it out as we go at this point. So no wonder we're having some behavioral challenges at this point uh, from individuals with Fragile X. We've got to have these schedules, and it's so important to have a visual schedule in place. If your child, adolescent, adult reads, it can be just a regular schedule. It can be something on the phone. It can be choice works on your tablet. It can be a number of apps that are available. Um, Planet is another good one, P-A-L-N, Plan It. Um, those are ways that we can put things into place right now in, in your home setting that will help them understand what's going on and calm the waters, so to speak. They really do need to move. There needs to be a way for a break that's a movement break. Now that we can't go do a lot of things that many of them did before, we can still go outside in our backyard. We can still use our own trampoline. We can still do things in the backyard that may be an obstacle course that you can set up or something that you can do that will give some uh, feedback to their, their sensory system. It's really important for them to have that movement. Um, distractors, that will trigger a challenging behavior. And those distractors right now are news clips anxious conversations, or a lot of excessive emotional conflict. And again, it's really tough because we have to be the agent of calm. And when we're anxious, it's pretty darn hard to do. But I, I do know that um, having a child with Fragile X um, and living with a child with Fragile X, although very rewarding, can be challenging. And I do know that those of you that um, are parents or caregivers are champions at this. 
So I would say um, living with coronavirus for you is not nearly as difficult as you may think. Just think of all the, the things that you've done to make your, your child or your adult child's life so much better and easier. I, I really know you can do this. And then another potential is the loud voice. Um, sort of the lack of awareness of nonverbal behaviors and communication, they read that really well. And so when they see you distressed or anxious, um, it really is hard for them to understand what's going on. And so again, that will be a potential trigger. We have to use these visual charts. We have to do some things at home that will constitute more of a resemblance of their work schedule or their school's schedule or their community schedule. I oftentimes even have a visual, um, you know, recommend using visual recipes so that if they're doing something with you, you can kind of give them an idea of how to perform that task. Many um, of the, the boxes and things that we can make from a box will have a visual, actually visual instructions on the back of them. So again, looking at those and maybe being able to contribute, it just sets the stage for familiarity. These are, these are things that are familiar to them and that really does calm them in the long run. So again, uh, as much of this as you can provide, it would really help them, I think, in the long run, sort of feel familiar and feel that they're um, understanding what's going on in their life at this moment in time. A lot of these things can be done with, with home scheduling, but also with new jobs that you might provide them. I know we're washing our hands a lot and the social story that I wrote for the foundation and, and they modified a little bit, actually made it much better. Uh, You'll, you're able to, to link into that. And that was something that we included was washing hands. But if we have these kinds of charts up, maybe it's something that you want them to do. Maybe they can take out the trash. Maybe they can do some shredding. A number of things that could kind of make their home life more of a routine, a schedule, sort of something like um, they would be doing at school or at work. It's really critical for you to keep a consistent schedule. The fact is they're not going to work, they're not going out in the community, and they're not going to school. But that does not mean that we don't continue our checklists um, in terms of what they need to do in the morning and what they need to do at night. Now, why is that important? The reason that we, we know this is important is because it's really setting the stage. It's, it's setting the stage for structure and predictability. And any of us who have anxiety know that we become obsessive compulsive at times when we want to kind of calm ourselves down. So we make sure we have lists. We make sure we put things away. We follow a routine. This is exactly what I'm talking about. This will reduce the level of anxiety and it will create a feeling of sameness quality of life for them because they're going to say, oh, good, this part of my life has not changed. I'm still getting up in the morning. I'm still having my breakfast. I'm still doing the things that I need to do in the morning. And I'm now getting ready for bed in the same way. And so that gives them a little gift. It gives them the gift of sameness, of familiarity, and calmness. Here are some accommodations that we can use to modify uh, behaviors. We know that not every one of us is the same. And even though we've met one child with fragile X syndrome, they often say this about autism, we've met one child with fragile X syndrome. It doesn't mean that everybody behaves the same exact way, nor do they respond to interventions the same way. So allow for that. Those of you that have uh, several children in your family who all have fragile X, you'll know that they're very different. And if you have girls with fragile X, they're going to behave in a different way. So be sure that you allow for those differences, allow for those breaks so that they do have some time for sensory breaks. You don't need to create a sensory lab. I'm sure OTs would tell you that. There's so many opportunities that you can provide them outside or even inside in terms of jobs, carrying a laundry basket to the laundry room, making sure that the dog is fed, you know, being able to carry water over to, to the dog's those are things that will give some heavy work that have a purpose. 
provide quiet space um, in terms of access to headphones, headphones and visual supports. This is a good thing to, to give to individuals with Fragile X as they go through their day. We need to have some sameness. They need to have some calming. So there's some really good calming exercises that are in different apps that they can be a part of. Give them a task when you're wanting them to transition. And again, right now, we're not doing a lot of transitioning. But when real life comes back to us, remember this. They're going to be asked to do a lot of transitioning. They do it at school. They do it at the job. Make sure that they have a task that helps them move on to the next transition, the next thing to do. We've, we've noticed that it makes it much easier sort of to cross that threshold, so to speak, to go to the next environment or the next activity. They need those routines. We've talked about that through this lecture and this webinar. Um, really, we want them to know what they are and then to get reinforced when they finish those particular tasks. Token boards, really a good way to summon an understanding that now we're working. This is work time, even though we're home. And there's only so much that I'm going to expect from you until it's over. And so when this board is filled, you're going to be finished with the task. A nice visual reminder of what the expectation is. We do create a lot of anxiety when we don't give a clear end um, to a task or what the true expectation is. Teach flexibility. Again, they're learning it right now, aren't they? This is really a time to teach flexibility. But we can do it in a systematic way, and that's what I'm talking about today. When we sort of bring school or work into our home and try to provide them with the opportunity to learn some flexibility in the way that they go through their schedules and their routines. They need choices. It's so important now, especially because think of how many choices have been taken away, have been completely absolved. Um, and, and this is this is really important because they're used to having choices. So I always say give them voice, forced choices. And it may be in their routine or their schedule, you can tell them that they can put it in any order that they want. So they get up, they can um, maybe, you know, make their bed first or eat breakfast first. So they can have that choice. Or maybe they straighten up and get, get dressed and then they have breakfast. Or maybe they have breakfast in their PJs and then they go get dressed. That's fine because you don't care the order of that. It's just that they need to accomplish each one of those, those particular tasks. And then any time that you're really responding and trying to direct them, be sure your voice is pretty neutral. Um, try very hard to control the level of intonation and use less animation in those times when you're really trying to modify this behavior and calm them down. So in summary, let's talk about what we've discussed today. Really, the challenges right now um, is that they don't understand what's going on and the changes are so difficult. And that's going to oftentimes result in behavioral challenges. So we've gone through a number of ways that you can accommodate, that you can provide that foundation so that they can feel calmer, so that they could feel that, that they understand and things are predictable. Remember that behavior serves a purpose. There's a function to it. It's not that they want to be bad kids. It's not like they want to be an adult that gets in trouble all the time because that's not how they're made. Instead, they're just trying to communicate. They're trying to show you um, something that's going on in them. And so during the time that you're trying to figure out what that purpose is, um, the function oftentimes is to express in some way protest or that there's uncertainty. And I think that after I've talked to many of you and, and during those phone calls that we've had or, or emails that we've had exchanges on, so many times um, that's really what's going on is this uncertainty is on steroids for them it's really really difficult and again they may not understand the full depth of what is going on with our society at this point and and a lot of the the fears that we have but they do understand that there's some big changes and they don't understand exactly why. And again, I don't know that we need to go into great detail about why this is happening. Instead, I would come forward with um, gifts of love and gifts of purpose 
and, and gifts of understanding through structure. So the function of the behavior is there um, to deal with the neurobiology. And that's so clear to so many of us. And those of you that are caregivers and parents, you know this, don't you, very well, that there's just a piece of, of that individual with fragile X that has some pretty solid neurobiology. And the only way they can communicate that something's uncomfortable is through their behavior. So just remember that that's really the foundation here. They're very aware of the emotion and the frustration and fear that, that we all have and that we're experiencing at this point. Um, I've been seeing a few clients um, in person because they just can't access the internet or they can't access a computer or there's, there's just so much um, anxiety that I really feel like I need to make that contact. And so when I'm wearing a mask and um, I'm seeing them for the first time with my mask and asking them to wear a mask, that's pretty difficult for them. And I think it's fearful for them. They see a change. And so again, I have to work through that with them as well. Individuals observe and understand um, our reactions to their behavior. They're really good at that. And again, that's what may in fact uh, continue the, the behavior. It may in fact reinforce that behavior. So let's be careful about our reactions to that behavior and make sure that we're not taking it personally, that it's something that an individual is not trying to do to get to us. They're simply either communicating or trying to deal with some fear that's part of their hard wiring, wiring part of their neurobiology and they want to behave. They want us to accept them and they want to have a positive social interaction with us. I believe this more than anything about this population and I know you do too. You know that about the kids that you um, work with or the kids that are in your family. So again, let's focus on that positive aspect of these individuals and let's provide them with all the opportunities that we can to get through this difficult time together. Thank you so much.